Good morning and welcome. Would you stand and worship with us?
So here's the problem this morning. Some of y'all look like your mother-in-law's moved in with you. And so we're all going to stand up. Whether you're a guest here this morning, I'll get to you in a minute, but I want everybody to stand up this morning. Everybody stand up, okay? Okay. I want you to turn to your neighbor, and I want you to tell them, 
Even if they don't look good, tell them how good they look this morning. Go ahead. Okay. There we go. Okay. 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 All right. Hold on now. Y'all, y'all getting, y'all, y'all about to get wild on me here. Now I want you to turn, I want you to turn to that same neighbor and I want you to tell them that you love them. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hey. Y'all, y'all, y'all ain't near as noisy he was when you were talking about, about telling the lies you was telling the truth. So the last thing we're going to do is I want you to welcome the neighbor. And all I want you to, I don't want you to move. I just want you to turn in a circle like this. Just turn around and welcome everybody. Come on, welcome. There you go. There you go. There you go. But if you... Are y'all in some hurry or something? So I want you to be seated now. Let's give the Lord a praise clap while you're being seated. Amen. I, I, I want to say to you, I'm a little bit out of sync this morning. This is normally where Anita comes up and she does all this welcoming and stuff. And then she, you know, I don't know nothing about this stuff. So all I know is in your worship folder, here it is. Hold your worship folder up like this. There's a little hickey-me-jiggy thing right here on the side. I don't know what the name of these things are, but... It looks like, what's it called? A QR, code. a QR code. Yeah. Whatever that is, if you're here for the first time, you just hit that and it tells you everything. It tells you what a great preacher I am, how good looking I am. This is where y'all say amen. That's what you say. Amen. So we want you to be welcoming. If you're here for the first time, can I just say thank you for coming? We're so excited about you being here. And, and please, I, I say to every person who visits our church, if you would give me seven chances, I know it's a lot, okay? Some of y'all been driving Fords for 70 years. Y'all been giving them the chances. I just asked for seven Sundays. And, and I want you just to come and learn about our church. And you can find out all kind of information about the church this way. I want to I get you to, to just know that this morning in here, there's a couple things I want to talk about. After the service today for a few minutes, Jason and Pam and Hal and all of them, we're going to have a meeting for the mission trip that we'll be taking in a couple of weeks. And we want y'all to come and just meet and make sure we've got all the questions to answer and all that. And, and then I want you to be to be praying for our church this week as we go through. Uh, this afternoon at 2, uh, 2 o'clock, Allison uh, uh, Estes, his father is going to be, his stepfather is going to be having his funeral here, Philip Hammer, good man. Uh, about the only daddy she ever really knew was how he was such a great guy. And uh, I wish you'd have got to meet him and know him because he Phil was just, he has so much information about life. And so that, that service is at 2 o'clock today. So you, if you want to come, you're more than welcome to come and be a part of that. As we go through the week, we got other folks that are sick. I want us to be praying this morning for, for Jan Clutch. Jan is a, had been moved from Matthews Hospital from last Sunday. This week, she's, they moved her yesterday over to Mercy Uptown, and, and she's going to have to have a major knee surgery tomorrow. She's had an infection in the body, and they had no idea, but it was actually coming from her knee replacement that she had some years back, and they're going in to fix that. So I want you to be praying for her. I also want you to be praying for Miss Nancy Dowdy. Uh, her and Earl attend our church. Nancy had a little episode. They thought it might have been a, like a little stroke, but they're not sure. But she sounded good yesterday, so I want you to be praying for them. Also, I want you to be praying for uh, Phil, Philip Full. Philip failed the other day and, and kind of got roughed up a little bit. So I want you to be praying for him, Miss Jean. And then I want you to be praying for a friend of mine, Buddy Tarleton. That's his sister, Diane Wilson, and Anita's, Anita's uncle. Uh, he had to have major surgery, and I want you to be praying for him. And so I want you to also be praying this morning for this coming year in our churches. I want you to begin to think about what am I need to do to finish the year in 2023? What do I need to do? How can I take and make a difference? See, in our church, we believe every day we should make a difference and make a difference to people around us. So I want you to do that. And then finally this morning, I want us to pray together as a church. In our church, if you're here for the first time, we, we, love, to, we love to pray. We're about a praying everything we do. 
And the way we do it here is we invite folks to come and pray at the altar if they so choose. Some folks will come and stand, some will kneel, some will sit right where they are. But we've learned one thing in Scripture, nothing's going to happen until we pray. There was a man that's been visiting our church for about six weeks, lives right across the street. And uh, he has been diagnosed with cancer, and it was pretty bad. And then last week, John sent me a thing and said, you ain't going to believe this, preacher. And I said, what's that, John? John said, they can't find the cancer. So let's give the Lord a praise clap for that. Amen. <laughs> and then last, I want you to be praying for Vicki Cannon. Vicki is part of our church, and she's been in hospital, at rehab, and she's in a lot of pain, so I want you to be praying. So let me invite you. Come and pray with us, please. Let's follow what the Lord says. Come pray with us. So, God, we just thank you for a wonderful day. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will just move in our church today. That, Lord, we'll hear your voice and we'll obey your voice and do what you've called us to do. Lord, we want to pray this morning for Miss Vicki. We want to pray, Lord, for Nancy. And we want to pray, Lord, for, for Jan this morning, for Buddy. We want to pray for the service this afternoon for Philip. Lord, and I pray that you would help us to... Lift up his name, and Lord, and he, we were going to celebrate his home going. I pray for Shane and Allison, Lord, and Miss Linda as they have gone through this. And I just ask you, Lord, let them know that this church loves them, and we're here for them. And Lord, I pray today that you would be with Philip Fulp and help him, Lord, to recover from this fall. And I ask you, Lord, to be with him and Miss Jean. Thank you for what you're doing, and we praise you this morning. In Jesus' name I ask, and all God's people said, Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise clap, okay?
make sure that uh, there's a young man we hired and we started this week and he's Joe Johnson and Joe is running around I don't know where he's at I saw him early this morning and he's our new ministry uh, children's director and I just want to make sure that you make sure you see a guy running around with his hair all pulled out you know it's him and his parents are here with us today and I'm so honored that they came to see what Joe's got himself into and so I, I just want you to be aware Today we're talking about something, and I want you to, if you're here for the first time, I'm a pastor who believes in getting up and down. So get up. Here we go. Everybody get back up. <laughs> Y'all ain't that tired. Good gracious. So I want you to hold your hands like this. Everybody hold your hands. We ain't not doing it till everybody does it. We're going to put on Jesus. Last week we learned last week to put the helmet on, so put your helmet on. Don't you feel better? Yeah. Now I want you to hold your hand out like this. Guess what we're going to talk about today? Sword. Let's give the Lord a prayer clap. You be seated. All right, here we go. So, so one of the things that we learn in, in the scripture is about putting on Jesus. Everything that you read in Ephesians 6 is, is about putting on Jesus. And, and Jesus is the whole thing of life when it talks about the armor of God. And what it does, it really begins to show you that every morning you need to get up and start putting on Jesus before you go out. How many of you this week, there's a survey, I love surveys. How many of you this week forgot to put your armor on? Don't raise your hand, don't raise your hand. But you forgot to put your armor on and when you got on the road you wish you had, it. raise your hand. Absolutely. So what happens every morning when you get going in life, you don't know what's going to be out there. If you're going up I-77, there is no way you know what's going to happen. Because see what happens, the North Carolina people don't know how to drive. And then the South Carolina people, we're missing, we're, in South Carolina, we're trying to avoid the potholes. So we go into North Carolina driving like that, so. But what happens, every day in our life, we're going to have opportunities to speak for Jesus, and then there's going to be opportunities come our way that it's going to be a struggle for us. This morning in my personal devotion, I'm reading Dr. David Jeremiah's devotion, and what happens when we get discouraged? We put the armor of God on every morning, we put our helmet on, and then today we're going to talk about the sword. But every day, no matter when you put all that on, you're still going to have struggles in life. 
It doesn't immune you from struggles, but it gives you the power to get through the struggles. And that is the key of this whole thing. In our world today, I just want to give you a statistic, and I want you to think about this. How many of you remember COVID? Raise your hands. Raise, raise your hands. I remember COVID. Thank God it's gone. What happened during COVID, this is what the church attendance was across America was here. It was very, it was pretty good. Since COVID ended some year or so ago, now the same people that were going to church here, now only 31% of the people in America are going to church. That were going before COVID, only 31%. We're, we're going in the wrong direction. It's the lowest number ever recorded in history since America was formed and, and we kept up with numbers. What's the problem? It's because we quit teaching our people how to get through life and the struggles of life. And this is the whole reason we're doing this entire series this summer is to teach you to put on Jesus so that you can be a part of that and helping us. I don't know about you, but in Ephesians 6, 17, we read these words, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The purpose of the sword of the Spirit is the Bible. It's the Word of God. I don't know what your Bible is, but I don't, and I tell people, they say, what's your favorite translation? I use like 13, you'll see them this morning. I, I, I want to read one I can understand. There's a translation called the Message Bible. It, right underneath it, it says the redneck version. But the Bible is the ruling God of our faith. And I can tell you as a pastor, this is where I stand and this is where this church stands. There's no errors in that book. There is no errors. There's some people that get all whoppy jaw about things, but there's no errors in that book. It's been recorded for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and no error has ever been discovered. There's people that think they do. And the problem of it is you're reading and translating from Hebrew to Greek, Aramaic, and you get all this, but all you got to do is pay attention and read and study and spend time on it. The problem that we have today is that we, we, we find the word of the Lord and we read one verse and we think we got the answers to the world's problems until Josh comes along and then got to read some more. So what happens to us is that God wants us to read his word. He wants us to use it as a sword. And in, in all of the armor of God, there is only one place in the armor where there is an offense as well as a defensive weapon, and it is the sword, which is the word of God. The word sword the sword of God is only used one time in all of Scripture. Now, there's other swords, but not like this. And what we can learn is, is that God wants us to be people who can be strong when struggles of life occur. See, every single day, you may not believe it, and you keep, you got to understand that the devil does not mind you coming to church this morning. You say, what? No, he didn't mind it. He gets upset when you come and pray. He gets upset when you raise your hand, and he really gets mad when you open your Bible and start reading the Word. And he wants you not to read the Word. And here's the famous thing. Well, I don't understand the Bible. I, I, I get it. I've been studying all my life, and there's things that I don't understand about the Scriptures. But I keep digging on it, keep digging on it. So the Holy Spirit is the power of the Word to save our souls, then give us a spiritual strength, to become a mature soldier, if you will. Fighting with the Lord and corruption that goes on in the world, the more we know and understand about the Word of God, the more useful we will be in doing the will of God, the more effective we will be standing against the enemy of the soul. So when we look at this whole thing, the, the, the sharpening of the sword is when we read God's Word and we read it every day and we begin to apply it in our life. To understand the connection between the sword and the word of God, it's first important to understand that the power of God's word. Hebrews 4, 12 writes it this way, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates, dividing the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. See, one of the biggest problems in the church today is we have a lacking of knowledge of God's word. Do you realize today you can look on the internet and you can find God's word over and over and it's more now than ever. Even though the Bible is still the number one book published in the world, 
Today, we have the internet, and we can pull up any translation that you have. It, it, and what's amazing to me is that you can pull it up, and it'll even give you different languages. It gives you languages that you, I can't even, listen, I can barely speak English, let alone try to learn another one. But the problem of it is, we don't really spend the time reading. We, we, we read our devotion. My devotion this morning was repeating songs about the old hymn songs, Be Not Discouraged. I've got you in the palm of my hand. All these things, what the Lord is trying to show us this morning. And he tells us something that you and I need to understand. That Jesus used the word as an offensive weapon in Matthew 4. He works with it and tries to show us. When we're facing trials, we can find peace in knowing that God is on our side. And the way you know that is by studying his word. I don't know about you this morning, but the more I read God's word, the more I'm inspired to want to do what he's called me to do. See, this week I was at getting fuel for my truck. I've got one of those diesel dogs, and I was filling up. It takes a little longer, and, and I don't know why, but it just seems to do. And I was standing there and just kind of mind my own business. And I happened to look around the pump, and there was a lady there, and she was in her car crying. And I thought, this is not good. I wonder what her husband did to her to make her cry like that. Women, it's okay for you to say it's oh me or something right here. This is where it began. And so I just finally, the Holy Spirit said, you need to speak this last. I said, ma'am, are you okay? Now, without the Holy Spirit, without the Word of God, I wouldn't have done that. The Word of God says, it's not about me, it's about others. And I said, ma'am, are you okay? And, and she said, well, I, 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 something, I'm trying to get gas, I'm trying to get back to Mooresville, and, and I've been to Columbia, my daughter had a baby, and I realized I'm out of fuel, and, and I, I don't have any money, I don't carry cash, so let me do a survey right here. Pauls, how many of you carry cash with you wherever you go? There's about 12 of us. And, and so uh, she said, I, I don't, my card won't work. And the Holy Spirit said, fix it. And I said, ma'am, let, let me help you. And she began to weep because she wanted, and I was able to help her. You, you see, the thing about it is the Bible tells us, God's word teaches us we're to help other people. That it's not about me. It's about helping other people. And, and what I've learned about this armor that's putting on Jesus is that the armor of God is an illustration in the Bible that reminds Christians about the reality of spiritual battle and describes the protection available to them. Do you realize that you are a protection for other people? That God places you in certain places to help other people to protect them from making a mistake. You're there to encourage them when they're down. You don't even, you may not even know them, but the Bible teaches us that we're to help them. And see, each piece of the armor is a, has a distinctive purpose, and it means defense against the temptation and the evil. Listen, we live in a world today where evil is rampant. We just saw this past week on July the 4th, mass shootings all over the country. And you want to see evil, there it is. That's what evil looks like. You and I, we cannot solve problems by killing each other. We solve problems by getting on our knees and praying for each other. This is the problem that we have because we don't know the word of God. And we need to be people that understand that these purposes are important. And God gives us those purposes. See, the armor of God in the Bible is an outfit of spiritual protection against the schemes of the devil. So I want you to take your finger. You ready? Everybody hold your finger up. I don't care which side you use. Put it in your mind right here. This is the battlefield. Repeat this with me. This is the battlefield. Let's do it with a little bit of enthusiasm, okay? One, two, three. This is the battlefield. So what happens, you got to understand that God is trying to protect your mind. And in the world today, anything goes. That is not the way the Bible wrote it. For us, there's got to be a standard of going on. Can you imagine not having a standard when you leave today and go out here off of Dam Road and 160, that traffic light? Would you imagine what it would be like to not have a traffic light there? The way some of y'all drive, I, I ain't never going that way if there's not a stoplight up there. 
But so what happens, he teaches us that well, there is a standard and we need to do it. Every Christian person who's ever given their lives to Jesus Christ needs to be trained. And the way you get trained is right here. This is the training book. This is the hand guide, if you will, for each one of us. So the Word of God helps us to advance and put Satan on defense because we know that the Word of God is active and it needs to be sharpened in our lives. So the Word, we begin to realize that, that God gives us an offensive weapon against Satan himself. And how do we do this? How can we take the sword of the Spirit and, and begin to use it as a way to help us? Well, first, you need to ask God to give you some discernment when you're dealing with a situation. When I'm standing there and the Lord, I'm listening to this lady, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to give me discernment. Is, is this what you want me to do, Lord? Is this? It doesn't matter. Let me tell you my philosophy so you need to know. God didn't ask me to understand what she's going to do with the money. That wasn't my job. My job was to give her the money and help her get gas if that's what she so cho chose it for. Once I give it, I'm, it ain't mine. It wasn't mine to begin with. And when we learn that, we begin to realize that God wants us to have discernment on know how to best help somebody. What I mean is, is that not everybody that you see, God is going to use you to help them. God has someone planned to help them, but you might not be that person. But God does have something for you to do. Someone said, how do you know when you're supposed to help somebody? Let me tell you my redneck version of this. For me, it's when the Holy Spirit moves on me and I start having bumps and get all fuzzy and all that kind of stuff. That's how I know I'm supposed to be involved. If, and I'm being serious. I, I'm the first one who wants to help everybody. And I learned I can't help everybody because if I help everybody, I'm going to take Jeff's blessing away from him. I'm going to take Doug's blessing away from him. I'm going to take Danny's blessing away from them. Because God has us in an area where we're to help people around us. And we're to advance the kingdom. And God wants us to guard our hearts. Not everything you see is what you think it is. Not everything you see and hear is truth. You need to know that. If you're a Christian this morning and you're watching the History Channel to get insight to the Bible, turn it off. <laughs> that is not where you're going to get incitement. It, when I watch it and I watch the History Channel for, for talking about the Bible, I get incited, but it ain't the good side. Number three, you need to share the gospel with other people. And he says that our sword of the Spirit is that we tell people about Jesus Christ. I, I love Jeff. Jeff, come up here and stand. Come and stand with me just for a second. I, I want to help you for a second. Jason, come over here and help me for a second. Come up here, Jason. Come on. I, I, he, these are two good-looking guys. And this is where you say amen. That's what I thought you was going to say. So here, here's, here, I want to show you how God does and how you can witness to people. Now, Jeff is a barber. He cuts hair. He does a good job on his own self, don't he? <laughs> and, and so can you imagine being in his, his barber chair and he's sitting there and he wraps that thing around him and puts where it's about to choke you to death. And, and what, he's got about six minutes to cut hair, ten minutes maybe. And if he gets... So he's got, he's got the person sitting in the chair's undivided attention. He got a chance to witness to them. But Jeff don't go for the juggler vein because he can't get his hand in the cape. But he's not going for the juggler vein. What he's doing is he spends time talking to that person, and he gets a chance to witness that. Jason owns an automotive shop. If you've got a Ford, he can help you with that. We fix them all. We fix them all. That's right. Jason, when you go to, if you got car trouble, when you go to Jason's shop and you come in there, Jason's got to listen to you for you explain to him what is wrong with your car. Now, there might be questions like this. When did the problem start? Well, my husband drove it last. That's when the problem started. When is, what kind of noise does it make? When this, what, this noise, I don't know, sounds like a bell ringing or something. You see, he's got to ask questions. And by him asking questions, he's able to help the person. Now, if you've got a Hyundai, he, he really needs to help you. I'm just kidding. What happens in this is that you, you, he's got to listen, and then he's got to speak to the person. He's got to try to help the person. So you give these guys a big hand. Would you do that for me? 
If, if you need a haircut, see Jeff. If your car's broke down, see Jason, okay? So, so what happens, we, we got to understand that you and I have got to, to share the gospel with each other and with the people. And no matter where you work, what you do, God will bring an opportunity every single day to that. So you need to know this morning, you need to choose before the day starts that you're going to put on Jesus because as soon as you get out of your home, the battle begins. See, today I want you to be certain about your salvation. I want to know that you know that you know that you love Jesus Christ and you've asked him into your heart because you, God can't help you in the battle if you're not sold out to him and you've not given your heart to him. Be certain of that. And then make sure every day you get in God's word. I tell people every day, trying to teach people about how to learn how to read, is just start out with a devotion. And the verses that it says, take those verses and look them up and read it. And then I want you to pray. Say, Lord, I don't, I don't know how to pray. Just, just pray. God's listening. God is listening. He's not interested in you getting the these and the does and all the words. Because when he listens to me, he goes, what a mess, but keep on talking, Barry. You see, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be super smart. You just need to talk to Jesus. He says, we want you to do this. He wants us to prepare us every day for the battle. And as believers of Christ, Christians understand that the gospel is God's power for salvation. When we read it, we understand. He says in Ephesians 1.13, we also include that in Christ, you have heard the message of truth. It is the gospel of the salvation. There's only one way to heaven, and it's through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. And we are the people that are supposed to talk about it. So when we talk about the sword, which is the word of God, I want to do something different this morning. I want you to hear it from another angle. I want you to hear it from an angle that you might not think about too much. And it's this. What did Jesus say about the word? What, what did Jesus say about the word? Well, you know, I don't know about you, but if you're here and you're part of our church, I want to encourage you. In September, I'm going to start a new series on Sunday nights for about eight weeks. And it's going to be on the first season of The Chosen. I want you to watch all of them. So what you do is you go get eight packs of popcorn, and you pack popcorn one for chapter one, and then the second and third. So what happens, I want you to see how Jesus can come alive through The Chosen. And, and what happens is that Jesus in The Chosen, and what we read, he's quoting Scripture and it's amazing where he gets it from. Jesus seems to say a lot about God's word. He uses the word as a defense against the devil's temptation. Hebrews 4 says, it's, and Then Jesus was led by the Spirit. In Matthew, I'm sorry, Matthew 4, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after the end of that, verse 11 says, And then at the end, then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended to him. If, they, if the devil is going to try to trick Jesus, he's going to try to trick you. So turn your neighbor and point him. He's going to do you. Say that. Turn and look at him. He's going to do you. That's how the devil works, my friend. If he's going to tempt Jesus, he's going to tempt you. And you and I have got to be ready to go. He frequently quotes the Old Testament in his sermons and, and that, that God's word will never pass away. Matthew 24 says it this way. Heaven and earth will pass away, but, by, but my word will never pass. Do you realize if you were to read Scripture and you were to able to see from Genesis through the Old Testament, all through here, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, you would discover there's 39 books and Jesus is in every single book. He is there all the way through it. From Genesis, he says, now let us make man. Jesus was on the spot. And what happens all through the Old Testament, all 39 books, Jesus is revealed in those books. And what we learn is that one-tenth, there are over 1,800 verses that's quoted, and 800 of Jesus is quoting about the Old Testament. And he teaches us about it. Just think about when Jesus is in the 40 days of wilderness, and he's being tempted in Matthew 4, and then the, the Satan comes along, the devil tempts him, do you know what book he quotes on the temptations? He quotes the book of Deuteronomy. He, and whatever Satan says, Jesus comes back with a verse. This is why I teach the way I teach and preach. is because I'm giving you a point. I give you a Bible verse. 
And this is what Scripture teaches us of how we defeat the battle is knowing God's Word. And someone says, well, what if I don't know the whole verse? Give the devil all that you got. Give him the words you got. Just give him what you got. And this, the Bible says he will set you free and the devil has to flee. So I'm trying to teach you this morning is this. In other words, God, the Word of God is never, ever going to change. Jesus is talking about that he bears witness about everything about him. And John 5, 39 says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think in them you have eternal life. The very scriptures that testify about me. Jesus is talking, and all throughout his time on earth, he is talking about the Old Testament. He uses it over and over. And so here's where you are in this church this morning. If you're here visiting with us this morning, you're our guest, and thank you. In this area, in this church, this is how we do it. We preach. If I start in the New Testament, you can guarantee I'm going to end in the Old Testament. If I start in the Old Testament, you can guarantee I'm going to get over into the New Testament because it's a bridge. It's all one book. All of it's good. So, well, but Jesus came and fulfilled all that he did, but there's still some good stuff in there. How about the Ten Commandments? How about those things? That he uses those things to help us to see. Now, let me give you this. He seems to place a large importance on the scripture about truth. He says in John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth and your word is true. Let me tell you about one of my heroes of the faith. His name is John Wesley. Most of you who've heard that name know that John Wesley is the founder of the Methodist Church. And, and John Wesley was a unique man. His, his mother had been a phenomenal example to him and his brother Charles and the other family members. And every day his mother would sit in a rocking chair and she had a bunch of youngins. And what the youngins realized is that when she sat down every day, she was a model to her children. And she would sit down and she would take her, um, um, what would you call it? I'll take that for $100. Take the apron and throw it over her head. And that meant to the kids, don't mess with mama. Some of you mamas in here need to get you a long apron. And so, or change your name from mama to something else. I don't know. But what happens in this is that John Wesley took that of how important it was to study God's word. My hero, John Wesley, was a man who, who felt the call and the movement toward God. But in his personal life, in his personal way of life, John Wesley had been baptized, confirmed, and ordained to the gospel but even in his own eyes, he felt like he was not quite a Christian. He, he knew what, in his life, he knew what it meant to have religious and trying to keep all the laws and be holy. But Wesley consistently was bothered because he had a passion in his life to prove to God that he was worthy to be blessed by God. Let me stop you right here. God loves you this morning. God is not mad at you. God is mad about you. He wants to love you and have a personal relationship with you. And it's not about keeping the laws and the do's and the don'ts. Some of y'all are so much better at keeping all the rules. I'm not a rule follower. I don't want to dot no I's and I don't want to cross no T's. And if you mess with me, I won't even put a period at the end of the sentence. What happens is that God is trying to teach us and John Wesley was he was, hung, he was hung up about works. Listen, you're talking to a preacher who loves to see his congregation work. We need to work. But Wesley thought in his mind, that he, work, 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 and that would keep his salvation. And that's not the case at all. So what happened is many of you may have known the story about him. He was reading God's word and trying to figure it out. And he meets a group of people. And these people are met on Altergate Street in London. So if you know anything about Methodism, you know that a lot of churches are called Altergate. And it comes from this. And there he, he listens to people speak the word of God. See, he's been doing all the talking, but he's not been listening. And after the message of one of these people from the Moravian church, he realized that he had never given his life to Jesus in, in a way that he would understand 
that he had to give it all to Jesus. You said, John Wesley? Yes, John Wesley. Because, see, he struggled. He didn't realize that God wanted you to have a personal relationship with him, a one-on-one. How many of you this week messed up at least one time this week? Would you raise your hand? Keep your hands up. We're going up to about 2,000. Anybody else? So what happens, Wesley finally realizes that he wants a relationship with Jesus. That's what God is drawing him to. And he says in these words, he said, all of a sudden, something changed inside. And I realized for the first time that I was emerging and teaching people about a relationship, not about keeping rules. See, it's hard sometimes. And if you know anything about John Wesley, you know this. He traveled all over the United States, all over the world for the most part, preaching one sermon after another. In his latter years, Wesley got mad because he couldn't preach more than four times in a day because he wanted people to know the truth about Jesus Christ and about a relationship. He wanted to know truth. Let me, let me say something to you this morning. Only God, listen to me, only God could have put this book together. This, I mean, there's some of y'all in here, y'all are smart people. But you, you ain't that smart. It's amazing when you look at the Bible, he puts it all together, and there's, quote, 66 books. So let me teach you. So there's 39 in the Old Testament, right? So the, how, do, how, many, how many is in the New Testament? It's real simple. Three times nine is 27. Y'all stick with the preacher and he'll teach you how to do this. So what happens is he wants to help us. And then there's two over thousands of years apart, 40 different authors. And they have one theme. The Word of God has one theme. The theme is this, redemption. Bringing back the people that were lost and bring them to a relationship with him. It's real and true. One thing, redemption. If you look through the Bible, you can see it from Genesis to Revelation. You can see that scarlet thread working its way all the way through it. Redemption. And Jesus says in Luke 24, Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning him. I'd like to have been there to see that. He begins to talk about it because Jesus it becomes the star. He, in fact, the Bible has one theme, and it's, it's redemption. It's a miracle that we get it because what happens, you look at other writings and other, other groups of people that are religious, here's what happens. It, 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 it would be one thing if the Bible only had one person writing, but it doesn't. The Koran is written by one person, Mohammed. Confusion writes the, conf the, the position of his thoughts of religion. Buddha writes his position, one person. Because there's one person, you would expect them to be uniform. The Bible on the hand is written by 40 different people, different ages, different strategies, three different continents. And he tells us the same story. The prophets and the poets and the fishermen and the kings and the shepherds and the scribes, it's the same story. It's been the same story. I've dedicated my entire life to reading this and studying every angle you can study. Some of the people who wrote this 40 wrote in their homes. Some wrote them in prison. Some wrote them on ships. And you cannot find a more diverse group than these writers. So let me, let me put it together. So let me do a little sample. So if I took 50 people in this room and I took pieces of paper and I just tore them all up off of one picture and gave it to everybody, the likelihood of all of it coming back to me is going to be very difficult to get this together. Because some of y'all in here, y'all, when y'all tear up something, y'all have this philosophy of tearing a piece of paper seven times. I don't, I don't know why you do that, but you do. And trying to put everything back together would be impossible. But the Bible is simplistic. You know how I know how simple it is? Because Joe Johnson is our new children's director, and he's back there working with those children right now. And what happens is the Bible is so simple that a child can understand it. Don't make it so complicated, my friends. There's so much archaeology findings today. And you say, what is archaeology? That's discovery of stuff that we've read about and preached about, and it's being discovered. There's more proof today about God and about Jesus Christ and Christianity than ever before, but we have less people coming. 
I was telling Bill Grantham this morning that in history of this great state of South Carolina, you can study in history of this state in Christianity when the economy is good, guess what happens? Church attendance goes down. But when the economy is bad, guess what happens? Church attendance goes up. All I'm asking you to do this morning is just be consistent. That's all I'm asking you to do. Don't move up and down. Just stay consistent in what God is trying to teach you. And it really helps us understand it. And you begin to realize that Jesus was speaking the words of the Old Testament to help you better secure yourself in the walk with him. So why is the word so important to us? The importance of the Bible is based on the fact that it's the revelation of God himself to us. John 1, if I could just encourage you today, if I could get you to read the Gospel of John, chapter 1, through about 1 through 14, you would discover these words. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He existed in the beginning with God which means Jesus. And you begin to realize that all of this is the beginning. Jesus is the word of the living God. He wants us to become students of the word. He wants us to be people that, as David writes in Psalms 1 and 2, he says, happier are those who reject the advice of evil people. So how many of you in this room, would be honest with me this morning, how many of you in here, when you were growing up, you thought maybe you wanted to be a police officer or a detective. Would you raise your hands? Y'all got to be kidding me. Y'all watching too much Walking Dead stuff. <laughs> when I was growing up, I, everybody wanted to be a fireman or, or a policeman. Really. And if you didn't, couldn't do that, you wanted to play baseball. I mean, th th these were the way it was. And today, we don't, people don't want to be police officers. You know why? Because nobody respects them. And that's not at all what it should be. I, I want to say this. Let me get on my soap opera for a second, if you'll let me do this. We're paying the wrong people the wrong amount of money. Your police officer ought to be making $5 million a year. Your basketball player ought to be making $20,000 a year. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, I feel better now. Do you? So what happens is that we, we've got to be people that understand you. God wants you. Let me, let me get you this mindset. I, I, I miscalculated on this one. That's why I look like I don't know what I'm saying. I have no clue what's coming out next. But you and I need to be people. When we're reading God's Word, we ought to be like a detective. We ought to be like a detective. We start looking at it. And a good detective digs into it and finds out things. See, if you've ever been to a crime scene, I hope that you never have. But what you have is you'll see when a, when a crime scene happens, the detectives arrive at the scene. And the first thing they do is they don't jump out of the truck and start running around like crazy. They first observe. And then they look around and they begin to get the details and, and try to do it. They start asking questions. And then finally, they put all the facts together to make a conclusion. When we as a student of the Bible, we approach Scripture like a detective. You come to the text and you look at it closely. When you read one verse, let me give you a piece of encouragement. When you read one verse, read the verses, two or three verses before and two or three verses after, and you'll get a better feel of what you're trying to read. You look for the details that are quick and easy to see. And then you look at the questions. You need to ask questions about it. There are no dumb questions when you're reading God's Word. You compare it with other Bible verses. This is why it's important that you have a concordance in there. You see a verse and it says, go down here to this one, look at this, and you compare these things. You begin to see it and, to, and be a detective. And what happens then, once the, all the facts are brought, you come out and something happens. We read he speaks, and we're transformed. We, we study the Bible together. God's promises are revealed to himself. He teaches us how to obey him and to show love to others. When we are changed to be more like Jesus Christ, our families, our workplaces, our communities 
will have an internal, eternal impact. This is why the Bible is so important in 2 Timothy. All scripture is God breathed. Listen, hear me out and let me finish with something like this. This book is written by 40 different authors, but this is not their words. These are the words of the Lord. It is his breath. And what happens in this story is, is that we miss it sometimes. We think that, that John is writing what he thinks. John's writing by the interpretation of the Holy Spirit. If you have ever been to seminary, which I have, I got a piece of paper. That's about all I got out of there because I don't remember none of it. Well, what happens in seminary is, is that you want, if you're taking a Greek test and studying the Greek, you want the gospel of John. You know why? Because it's the least educated. I like John a lot. He and I are kin people. We don't know a lot, but what we know, we believe. And what happens is you want to understand and dig into these things. So remember the Bible is God's love letter to you. It's a love letter to let you know how much he loves you and how much he cares for you. This is why it's important that you read God's word every day. So maybe some of you who are older can tell me when you were young and maybe some of you went off to, to the military and you got married before you left or you had a girlfriend and you write letters back to them. You, back in the day when we wrote letters, back before text came and emails came and all that. And you read these old letters and you read them and, 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 it, and it's really the person is trying to speak as best they know how. And But you can read and you can see the love that that person has for the one they're writing to. This is what God's love letter does. It's our handbook. The Bible, the Word of God is a handbook for our life. This is how we're to live and how to treat. How do you treat somebody who mistreats you? You love them and you forgive them and you pray for them. What if I don't like them? Jesus didn't ask you whether you like them or not. He says, as a Christian, you're to be like me. You're to imitate Jesus Christ. And when we act anything different, we're not doing what God's called us to do. The Bible also gives us an opportunity to see and know God. God wants us to know him in a personal relationship. So tomorrow when you're standing at a gas pump and there's a person weeping on the other side, what will you do? How will you help them? You, you see, this is why it's so important to be in the game, not sitting on the sideline. God wants us to get into the game, and he wants us to make a difference in other people's lives. So here's the problem. Here's the only problem I know that people tell me. Well, they ask me a question, I don't know the answer. What do I do? You tell them the truth. I don't know the answer. And then you say, but my preacher knows everything. I'll call him. So, so what I'm trying to teach you is this morning, share with people what you know. This is how important it is about God's word. If God's word has touched your life, share with people what he has touched your life with. That's all. That's all you got to do. When we had 15 young children, or not young children, but we had 15 kids and students receive Christ as their Savior and during vacation Bible school. It was very simple and plain. It wasn't very hard. The preacher dressed up like Huckleberry Finn. I look good, by the way. And Huckleberry Finn, and I just shared Jesus about him like Jesus shared it with me. And it was real simple. And our kids got saved in that. So let me tell you something. Let me tell you one last thing. See, I've learned this, is that the Bible, God wants to unlock the Bible to you and me so we can see our potential of what he's called us to do. See, I don't think we can fathom in our minds the potential that God has for us. I can tell you from reading Billy Graham's biographies and his books, he never thought for a minute that God could use him to be a great preacher. He didn't even think God could use him to be a preacher. I don't think Billy Graham wanted to be a preacher. But when he gave his life to Jesus and he sold out, and he built this relationship and began to dig in God's word, he began to realize it. See, what we do is that God wants to show your potential. Some of you in this room this morning, God loves you, and he's giving you the gift of teaching children and students and adults, and he wants you to do it. 
Quit making excuses and get after it. And only God can really give you the true capabilities of what you can do. See, I've learned in my personal life, there's nothing I cannot do if God is for me and wants me to do it. Nothing. There's only one thing I'm scared of. I'm not scared about dying. I'm not scared of me. I'm just scared of a snake. And I'm praying that God never asked me to pick up a snake. I don't think you say, well, what will you do? I'll be running so fast I won't hear him. But what he wants us to do is be people that will do what he calls us to do. Can I share my story with you just a little bit? See, growing up, I went to church every time the doors were open. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and any other night. Saturday mornings at the church we grew up, all of us young guys were there cutting grass. It's back when we had a push mower, and they would get like eight of us guys lined up, and we would start cutting grass. And, and we cut the grass. And, and we went to church all the time. My grandmother, Jan and I, her grandmother was one of the most godliest people of all around in our lives. She was the real deal. And we were taught to go to church. And this church would come along and, and have time. I don't know about you, but I've, have you ever had something that happened in your life that kind of set you back? Would you raise your hand? Have you ever had something that kind of set you back? Yeah. I, I, in my own personal life, uh, for some of you that are new today, you'll discover that um, I have an artificial eye. It's hard to catch me turning the other ways that you can catch me in it. But, uh, but I, I have an artificial eye. Six years old, I had to have an eye removed due to cancer. And so what happens, that thing, Satan knew that would be the weak point of me, and he worked against me in all things. As a kid in the fourth grade, I began to be so low, I didn't even want to live. I can remember it like it was yesterday. Then I discovered something, a basketball. I love the game of basketball. I don't care for the pro sports. I leave that to Linwood. He loves it. I like college basketball in high school, and I like to watch the little ones play as well. Then I read a book on a man by the name of John Wooden. You remember him. He won a few national championships, like nine or ten of them over at UCLA. Phenomenal Christian man, phenomenal guidance. And he kept saying in his book, no matter what, do what you have passion to do. Then all of a sudden in my life, I began to, to build up some confidence and began to understand. And God, all along, God had a plan. He's got a plan for your life today, folks. And through that, I learned to be a leader. I was an introvert. I know you can't believe that. But once in my life, I was an introvert. And all I know is this, is this one verse that my grandmother taught me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus died at the cross of Calvary to give you that power. He gives you the power of the word so that you can be, so that you can hold on to and grow in his faith. See, there's some things that you need to understand. I want you to listen to me just for a few more moments. In Scripture, when you're reading Scripture, I want you to listen to me this morning. The book of Psalms 119.27 says, Help me understand your laws, and I will meditate on your wonderful teaching. What he's saying to you is when you read God's Word, and you need to read it every day, he says this is what you need to do. After you read a piece of Scripture, Maybe it's a, a paragraph for me, whatever it might be. Some of you are reading through the Bible. Praise the Lord for that. But what I'm saying to you, here's what I want you to do today before you leave. I want you to understand it's not enough just to read God's Word. There's more to it than that. First, it says after I read these verses or after I read a verse, I need to ask a question. Is there sin that needs to be confessed in my life? Does God's Word make you aware of something in your life that you need to get rid of? Number two, when I'm reading it, is there some promise that I can claim? There are over 7,000 promises in God's Word. I guarantee you there's one in there for you. As you read the verses that you're trying to look at, you need to ask the question, is there an attitude that I need to change? Do I need to change my attitude towards someone, or do I need to change my attitude toward a thing that's going on? 
Am I a person who's turned into negative and have a terrible attitude? Do I worry and have guilt and fear and loneliness and bitterness and all those things that go? Do I need to change my attitude about something? And then as I'm reading, I'm studying and thinking, is there a command to be obeyed? Is God commanding me to do something here? It doesn't matter how you feel about it, but is God commanding you to do something? And then is there an example to follow? See, I'm always looking for positive examples. I don't need to be around negatives. I'm, I'm around me enough to cause the negative problems. I need to be around people that are positive and see things that I can't see. Is there a prayer that needs to be prayed? Do you know one of the greatest things that you can do in your Bible reading every day is to stand up wherever you do your Bible study at and read the verse aloud back to God? This is what God wants us to do. He wants us to read his work and, and read it back to him, praising him for what he has told us. You can use this prayer no matter where you are. Number, number seven is, is there an error to be avoided? Is God trying to say something in a verse to us that we're reading? Or say, he's trying to keep us from going down the wrong track. I see it all the time. And, and there are times when I have to come back and apologize and say I'm wrong. But maybe if I had read God's word before I spoke and got all whoppy jawed about things, I might not have had done that. God's word tries to keep us from making a mistake. And, and the other thing, when you're reading these verses or a group, is there's truth to be believed. We simply have to believe what God says about what the Bible says about God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the past, the future, heaven, hell, and other topics in the Bible. You don't get to cherry pick the scriptures. I like this one. I don't like this one. You don't get to do that. It's one big, large sum that God has spoken. And then the final one. Is there something for which to praise God? Yes, there is. See, despite all the attacks that we have today, I was sharing this with my staff this week. I've watched the last two weeks. I spent a little time watching the news, reading articles, and the church is under attack. You can sit and tell me that's not. I can show you articles after articles after articles of the church being attacked more than ever before. But the Bible is the greatest single source for so many culture achievements. The Bible is the greatest thing that has ever it's influenced music and art and agriculture and architect it, it, it if you took the bible out of the culture that we live in you would destroy most of the music the artwork and the architect over the last two thousand years the english language would not be where it is today if it had not been for the translation of the king james version the bible has flourished in spite of unrentless attacks all over us each day. So how do we win? We put on the armor of God. We put on Jesus in everything we do and say. We put on Jesus. So I want you to take your finger now, okay? I want you to, some of y'all are scared to touch your lips, but go ahead, touch your lips right here, put it right there. We need to ask God for us to speak the words that he would want us to speak. And all God's people said, amen. Let's pray for a second. Father, we just come to you right now. And I ask you, Lord, that you would equip me and this crowd here today with the sword of your spirit. That maybe, uh, God, that we might be ready to give you a reason that you would give us a reason of hope. Lord, whenever the devil launches and doubts and gives us twists and tries to make scripture something that's not, or tries to make us Act stupid in front of the other Christians. Lord, help us not to be that way. As I study your, your word today, help me to bear in mind of the original text of the passage so that it does not distort the meaning throughout all of the culture that we live in today that says anything goes. Reveal to me the meaning of your word and how it should apply to my life today. Help me, Lord, with that. I'm fighting offensively or in defense today. Help me to be your witness. Let me use your word to fight my battles. 
Lord, there may be someone here today who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be their day of salvation. And Lord, right now, I'm just, I'm just opening up this altar for people that can come and maybe somebody needs to come and pray this morning. Maybe there's something they've learned in this sermon today that they're not doing what they ought to be doing. And Lord, I pray that you would help us right now. But Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, all they have to do is say, Jesus, come into my life. Change my heart, forgive me of my sins, and help me to follow you. Their lives can be changed. Change our lives today, Lord, while we wait, just for a moment. Whosoever will come, come. So, Lord, we just want to thank you for this wonderful day. It's been a good day. We've looked at the Word, and we've learned today, Lord, that we don't hear many sermons about what did Jesus say about the Word. So, Lord, I pray today that you would help us to understand that you love us. You sent your Son, Jesus, to die on the cross. You let him resurrect so that we could have eternal life. Lord, today we thank you for what you're getting ready to do. God, would you give us a word this week? And all God's people say, amen. Let's give the Lord a praise clap. Every praise, 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 every praise